Welcome to Scary Bedtime Stories. I'm your host Jose, and I will be your guide, your Morpheus into the world of dreams. The goal of this podcast is to help you fall asleep by relaxing you, taking your restless mind off your problems, and help you get the rest that you deserve while I read to you a horror classic. I promise it won't be too scary. If the podcast helps you sleep, please leave me a review, tell a friend, and subscribe. Also, check out my other podcast, Technically a Conversation, where I go over a lot of dark and weird stories with my lovely co-hosts Isela and Elena. This week, we'll be talking about the United States Founding Fathers and whether they were boozy, floozy, or both. A link will be in the show notes or go to technicallyaconversation.com. We're going to tune out the outside world. That's the gentle rain and music you hear in the background. Hopefully that'll be enough to drown out your neighbor's barking dog and all the other noisy neighborhood sounds plotting to keep you awake tonight. Put the episode on repeat or make a playlist of several episodes while we wait for the Sandman to come. Every time you find your mind drifting away, focus on the story. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Make yourself comfortable in your bed. Flip that pillow around to the cool side and relax your breathing. Smear some Vicks under your nose and focus on how soft and cool your sheets are. Today, I'll be reading you The Interval by Vincent O'Sullivan. Miss Wilton passed through a little alley leading from one of the gates which are around Regent Park and came out on the wide and quiet street. She walked along slowly, peering anxiously from side to side so as not to overlook the number. She pulled her first closer round her. After her years in India, this London damp seemed very harsh. Still, it was not a fog today. A dense haze, gray and tingy ruddy, lay between the houses and sometimes blowing with a little wet kiss against the face. Miss Wilton's hair and eyelashes and her furs were powdered with tiny drops. But there was nothing in the weather to blur the sight. She could see the faces of people some distance off and read the signs on the shops. Before the door of a dealer in antiques, and second-hand furniture, she paused and looked through the shabby, unclean window at an unassorted heap of things, many of them of great value. She read the Polish name fastened on the pane in white letters. Yes, this is the place. She opened the door, which met her entrance with an ill-tempered jangle. From somewhere in the black depths of the shop, the dealer came forward. He had a clammy white face with a sparse black beard and wore a skull cap and spectacles. Miss Wilton spoke to him in a low voice. A look of complicity, of cunning, perhaps of irony, passed through the dealer's cynical and sad eyes, but he bowed gravely and respectfully. Yes, she is here, madame. Whether she will see you or not, I do not know. She is not always well. She has her moods. And then, we have to be so careful. The police, not that they would touch a lady like you, but the poor alien has not much chance these days. Miss Wilton followed him to the back of the shop, where there was a winding staircase. She knocked over a few things in her passage and stooped to pick them up. But the dealer kept muttering, It does not matter. Surely, it does not matter. He lit a candle. You must go up these stairs. They are very dark. Be careful. When you come to a door, open it and go straight in. He stood at the foot of the stairs, holding the light high above his head, and she ascended. The room was not very large, and it seemed very ordinary. There were some flimsy, uncomfortable chairs in glitter and red. Two large palms were in corners. Under a glass cover on the table 
was a view of Rome. The room was not a business-like look, thought Miss Wilton. There was no suggestion of the office or waiting room, where people came and went all day. Yet, you would not say it was a private room which was lived in. There was no books or papers about. Every chair was in the place it had been placed when the room was last swept. There was no fire, and it was very cold. To the right of the window was a door covered with a plush curtain. Miss Wilton sat down near the table and watched this door. She thought it must be through it that the soothsayer would come forth. She laid her hands listlessly, one on top of the other, on the table. This must be the tenth seer she had consulted since Hugh had been killed. She thought them over. No, this must be the eleventh. She had forgotten that frightening man in Paris who said he had been a priest. Yet of them all, it was only he who had told her anything definite. But even he could do no more than tell the past. He told of marriage. He even had the duration of it right. 21 months. He told too of their time in India. At least he knew that her husband had been a soldier and said he had been on service in the colonies. On the whole though, he had been as unsatisfactory as the others. None of them had given her the consolation she sought. She did not want to be told of the past. If Hugh was gone forever, then with him had gone all her love of living, her courage, all her better self. She wanted to be lifted out of the despair, the dazed aimless drifting from day to day, longing at night for the morning, and in the morning for the fall of night, which had been her life since his death. If somebody could assure her that it was not all over, that he was somewhere, not too far away, unchanged from what he had been here, with his crisp hair and rather slow smile and lean brown face, that he saw her sometimes, that he had not forgotten her. Oh, Hugh, darling. When she looked up again, the woman was sitting there before her. Miss Wilton had not heard her come in. With her experience, wide enough now, of seers and fortune tellers of all kinds, she saw at once that this woman was different from the others. She was used to the quick appraising look, the attempts, sometimes clumsy, but often cleverly disguised, to collect some fragments of information whereupon to erect a possible vision. But this woman looked as if she took it out of herself. Not that her appearance suggested intercourse with the spiritual world more than the others had done. It suggested that, in fact, considerably less. Some of the others were frail, yearning, evaporated creatures, and the ex-priest in Paris had something terrible and condemned in his look. He might well sup with the devil, that man, and probably did in some way or another. But this was a little fat, weary-faced woman about fifty, who only did not look like a cook because she looked more like a sempstress. Her black dress was all covered with white threads. Miss Wilton looked at her with some embarrassment. It seemed more reasonable to be asking a woman like this about altering a gown than about intercourse with the dead. That seemed even absurd in such a very commonplace presence. The woman seemed timid and oppressed. She breathed heavily and kept rubbing her dingy hands which looked moist, one over the other. She was always wetting her lips and coughing with a little dry cough, but in her these signs of nervous exhaustion suggested overwork in a close atmosphere, bending too close over the sewing machine. Her uninterested hair, like a rat's pelt, was eked out with a false addition of another color. Some threads had got into her hair too, her harried, uneasy look caused Miss Wilton to ask compassionately, Are you much worried by the police? 
Oh, the police. Why don't they leave us alone? You never know who comes to see you. Why don't they leave me alone? I'm a good woman. I only think what I do is no harm to anyone. She continued in an uneven, querulous voice, always rubbing her hands together nervously. She seemed to the visitor to be talking at random, just gabbling like children do sometimes before they fall asleep. I want to explain, hesitated Miss Wilton, but the woman, with her head pressed close against the back of the chair, was staring beyond her at the wall. Her face had lost whatever little expression it had. It was blank and stupid. When she spoke, it was very slowly, and her voice was guttural. Can't you see him? It seems strange to me that you can't see him. He is so near you. He is passing his arm around your shoulders. This was a frequent gesture of Hughes, and indeed, at that moment, she felt that somebody was very near her, bending over her. She was enveloped in tenderness. Only a very thin veil, she felt, prevented her from seeing. But the woman saw. She was describing Hugh minutely. Even the little things, like the burn on his right hand. Is he happy? Oh, ask him does he love me? The result was so far beyond anything she had hoped for that she was stunned. She could only stammer the first thing that came to her head. Does he love me? He loves you. He won't answer, but he loves you. He wants me to make you see him. He is disappointed, I think, because I can't. But I can't unless you do it yourself. After a while, she asked, I think you will see him again. You think of nothing else. He is very close to us now. Then she collapsed and fell into a heavy sleep and lay there motionless, hardly breathing. Miss Wilton put some notes on the table and stole out on tiptoe. She seemed to remember that downstairs in the dark shop, the dealer with the waxen face detained her to show her some old silver and jewelry and such like but she did not come to herself. She had no precise recollection of anything till she found herself entering a church near Portland Place. It was an unlikely act in her normal moments. Why did she go in there? She acted like one walking in her sleep. The church was old and dim, with high black pews. There was nobody there. Miss Wilton sat down in one of the pews and bent forward with her face in her hands. After a few minutes, she saw that a soldier had come in noiselessly and placed himself about half a dozen rows ahead of her. He never turned around, but presently she was struck by something familiar in the figure. First, she thought vaguely that the soldier looked like her hue. Then, when he put up his hand, she saw who it was. She hurried out of the pew and ran towards him. Oh, Hugh, Hugh, have you come back? He looked around with a smile. He had not been killed. It was all a mistake. He was going to speak. Footsteps sounded hollow in the empty church. She turned and glanced down the dim aisle. It was an old sexton or verger who approached. I thought I heard you call, he said. I was speaking to my husband. But Hugh was nowhere to be seen. He was here a moment ago. She looked about in anguish. He must have gone to the door. There's nobody here, said the old man gently. Only you and me. Ladies are often taken funny since the war. There was one in here yesterday afternoon. Said she was married in this church and her husband had promised to meet her here. Perhaps you were married here? No, said Miss Wilton desolately. I was married in India. It might have been two or three days after that when she went into a small Italian restaurant in the Bayswater district. She often went out for her meals now. She had developed an exhausting cough and she found that it somehow became less troublesome when she was in a public place 
looking at strange faces. In her flat, there were all the things that Hugh had used. The trunks and bags still had his name on them, with the labels of places where they had been together. They were like stabs. In the restaurant, people came and went, many soldiers too among them, just glancing at her in her corner. This day, as it chanced, she was rather late and there was nobody there. She was very tired. She nibbled at the food they brought her. She could almost have cried from tiredness and loneliness and the ache in her heart. Then suddenly, he was before her, sitting there opposite at the table. It was as it was in the days of their engagement, when they used sometimes to lunch at restaurants. He was not in uniform. He smiled at her and urged her to eat, just as he used to in those days. I met her that afternoon as she was crossing Kensington Gardens and she told me about it. I have been with Hugh. She seemed most happy. Did he say anything? N no. Yes, I think he did, but I could not quite hear. My head was so very tired. I did not see her for some time after that. She found, I think, that by going to places where she had once seen him, the old church, the little restaurant, she was more certain to see him again. She never saw him at home, but in the street or the park, he would often walk along beside her. Once, he saved her from being run over. She said she actually felt his hand grabbing her arm suddenly when the car was nearly upon her. She had given me the address of the clairvoyant, and it is through that strange woman that I know, or seem to know, what followed. Miss Wilton was not exactly ill last winter, nor so ill, at least, as to keep to her bedroom. But she was very thin, and her great handsome eyes always seemed to be staring at some point beyond, searching. There was a look in them that seamen's eyes sometimes have when they are drawing on a coast of which they are not very certain. She lived almost in solitude. She hardly ever saw anybody except when they sought her out. To those who were anxious about her, she laughed and said she was very well. One sunny morning, she was lying awake, waiting for the maid to bring her tea. The shy London sunlight peeped through the blinds. The room had a fresh and happy look. When she heard the door open, she thought that the maid had come in. Then, she saw that Hugh was standing at the front of the bed. He was in uniform this time, and looked as he had looked the day he went away. Oh, Hugh, speak to me. Will you not say just one word? He smiled and threw back his head just as he used to in the old days at her mother's house when he wanted to call her out of the room without attracting the attention of others. He moved towards the door, still signing to her to follow him. He picked up her slippers on his way and held them out to her as he wanted her to put them on. She slipped out of bed hastily. It is strange that when they came to look through her things after her death, the slippers could never be found. This concludes The Interval by Vincent O'Sullivan. Stay tuned for next week's episode where we'll start a new story. If you enjoyed the podcast and it helped you sleep, don't forget to subscribe, tell a friend, and leave me a review. You can also follow me on all the socials at Scary Bedtime and listen to my other podcast, Technically a Conversation, at technicallyaconversation.com. All the links will be in the show notes. Have a good night.